So, um, you, um, the Blues Brothers, right? I remember watching the Blues Brothers 2000, and you're in that. How did, how did that happen? Like, well, uh, you know the story about uh, Dan Aykroyd got the idea for the look of the Blues Brothers from me? Yeah, I heard, I read a bit of, yeah. And, uh, cause they used to play at a club in Kingston, Canada, where uh, he hung out when he was going to college. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, back then I'd wear like a black suit and my hair would be slicked back and <laughs> shades on. And, uh, that's where he got the look. So if I didn't have a, you know, a, oh, but handcuff a handcuffs <laughs> for my heart case, and I didn't wear a hat. <laughs> but uh, we had become friends and uh, he had told me that story several times. And um, they'd already done the Blues Brothers movie. Mm. And then we were going to do the Blues Brothers 2000, and uh, I don't remember who called who or whatever, but I yeah, I got the I got my ticket to fly up to Toronto, and that's where we filmed it. All Toronto, right. yeah, that right. was seen with the two bands. At yeah, the, at the end. <laughs> that was all done in one day. And uh, I wish they I don't know if anybody did, but I wish they'd filmed. All of us just hanging out backstage and everything. All the yeah, to make like to put in the making of it or something. Cause yeah, just blimey. all the joking around and laughing and telling lies. Yeah. And <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Because I mean, boy, you know, like you know yourself on there on the stage, just hold like Coco Taylor and like and Hayes, BB and yeah. Bo Diddley and Eric Clapton yeah. and Dr. John and it's like Lou Rawls was there. Yeah, and Coco Taylor. Yeah. And, the only reason I sang that one line, and there, it was supposed to be Coco's line, mm. and she kept blowing it. <laughs> and uh, Paul Schaefer was the musical director. And he yeah. said, okay, Charlie, you take it. Take what? What? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I had to like real quickly memorize the line. Because yeah. uh, um, you know, yeah, because yeah, you got all the cameras there, and they were like, bang, oh, I was fine. Oh yeah, they're not into wasting any time. Yeah. You got to get this done, you know. Yeah. Uh, wow. So it, it was a certain amount of pressure involved. Yeah. Uh, but just to be with all, that's where I first met Joshua Redman. Yeah. He's a saxophone oh, player. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we, we just last year did a, a show together, his band and my band, and he sat in with me and I sat in with him, and then the end we all played together. Cool. It was a lot of fun. So I'm, um, like Howling Wolf, you know, you knew. Howling Wolf. I mean, I'm a big fan of Howling Wolf and, and Hubert, you know. Um, did you just what? Did you just walk up and say, G'day, hey, I'm Charlie, how you going? You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, or someone said, oh, you should come and meet, how, you know. How, well, I, meeting I used those to just guys, go you know, there you just, and, uh, to Silvio's. Uh, there's a club at the corner of Lake and Kedzie uh, in Chicago. And uh, I just loved uh, the band, the way they sounded. Hubert would hold his guitar almost straight up and down. Yeah. And he'd be like holding it like this, his fingers just be flying up and down, he'd be rocking. Uh -huh. And man, he'd be playing the most insane, wild solos. Yeah, yeah. And um, I remember the first time I saw Wolf, he, he was sitting in a chair. He often sat in a chair, which is on the floor, with the bandstand right behind him. Mm. And I don't ever remember him getting up on the bandstand at Silvio's, but uh, then at some point he started getting up and then like he just kept getting up and getting, <laughs> yeah. man, he was a big guy. He looked yeah. like the Rock of Gibraltar <laughs> and that voice. Yeah. He was uh, as powerful as he sounds on record in person. It was like a thousand times more. Like you look around and the whole audience would just be like, just mesmerized by this guy. <laughs> and people were hardly danced. I mean, it was just tables and chairs, and he would like walk around singing and kind of prowling through the yeah, crowd. Yeah, stalking around. People would dance off to the sides. Uh, yeah. And he would talk, you know, he would say, uh, you know, we got Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Smith up here from Penton, Mississippi to see their daughter and yeah. let's have a hand for them. And, yeah, people would clap, and, and uh, Joe Smith over in the corner there, it's his birthday today, and everybody would clap, and 
just kind of give the latest news of, <laughs> and then they say, and we got our, our white friend here who comes out to see the wolf in all kinds of weather. Let's have a hand for the white boy. Yeah. Stand up, white boy. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I was just hanging around. He just thought of me as a fan. I never asked to sit in or anything. Yeah. Uh, anywhere I went, I was just happy to be in those clubs, listen to the music. And yeah. having come from Memphis, I already knew how to drink. Yeah. So <laughs> I just fit right in. And uh, So that was... I would work. request tunes, you know. Yeah, yeah. So Wolf just thought of me as a, a fan at first, but I got to know Johnny Jones, the piano player, real well, and, and he found out that I played, and he told Wolf I played, and then Wolf would invite me to sit in and stuff like that. Wow. And the same sort of thing happened with Muddy. I wouldn't ask him to sit in. He was he always played at his home club was. Uh, uh, I gotta forget the name of that. Johnny uh, uh, Pepper, Johnny Pepper's owned it. Huh? Pepper's Lounge yeah. on 43rd Street. And uh, this, so he thought I was a fan because I'd ask, play Rolling and Tumbling or yeah. something. And he's, how do you know that tune, boy? You know, I got all the records, you know. Huh? I'd request the old numbers. Yeah. yeah. And he just thought I was a fan. I wasn't like, you see guys holding up their harmonica, you know, can I sit in? Uh, yeah. I would never do that. Yeah. So, uh, but I got to know a waitress that worked there really well, and uh, she found out that I played, and she told me, well, you ought to hear Charlie play a Monica. Mm -hmm. He's pretty good. So that was the end of me being just on the sidelines, and Buddy called me up to sit in, which wasn't unusual. People sat in all the time, because yeah. Peppers was open till four in the morning, <laughs> and on Saturday night it was open till five in the morning. So that's a lot of time to kill. So Muddy was always happy to have people sitting in. And a lot of musicians hung out there. Yeah. That's where I first met Robert Nighthawk. I remember sitting at the at Pepper's Lounge for a while there. You could get a whole meal, like home cooking, soul food, oh, southern yum. style of eating, which yum, I, <laughs> I missed. You couldn't finally you couldn't find it anywhere in town. Meat and three, they call it. You know, you get. <laughs> smothered pork with uh, cabbage and mashed potatoes and black eyed peas and stuff like that. And, and, and there's Muddy Waters a few feet away playing and, and, uh, and having a drink. Anyhow, I'm sitting at the counter and uh, I see Walter Horton come in the door. Mm -hmm. Place is packed. And he's got this guy with him I'd never seen before, real sharp dressed, had his hair styled and there. I thought, I wonder who that guy is. And, and Walter sees me and starts coming through the crowd, you know, up to me, and he said, "Hey, Charlie, I want you to meet my old friend Robert Nighthawk." Wow, Robert Nighthawk, you know, because I knew who he was. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I guess Nighthawk had been out of town and had just come back to town and mm. was making the rounds. And, uh, but we played together that night because Buddy had him sit in and. And uh, from me knowing Shaky Walter, Nighthawk knew I played, and they played, and I played. I mean, it was just a jam session. Mm -hmm. kind of. The only thing that was unusual was that there was nobody my age in these clubs. Yeah. Uh, black or white. Uh, mm -hmm. They just, this was adult music as far as I was. Uh, so you weren't, um, like, nervous? You know, like, I mean, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, Nah, yeah. I was, it was like being at home for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but everybody there was from the South. Yeah, right. Yeah. I'd say 90% of them were directly from the South, or at least a generation removed. Mm. Maybe their parents were born there or something. But So we all liked the same music and the same food, and we were from the same place. And they it, thought of me as just a homeboy. Yeah. Was, mm. Even though I was white, I was welcome. And when they found out I played, they were really encouraging and supportive cool. and and, uh, and tickled it. Yeah. First of all, they were impressed that I would come alone to these clubs and exactly. hang out all night with them and that, uh, you know, I'd just be there by myself. Because all sorts of things in some of those clubs, you know, and especially when a white guy walking, you know, like, um, I don't know, fighting guns, you know. Just, oh, they were rough. They were like, yeah. it was a lot of, 
I remember the picture, I've seen a picture of you, um, you know, I think it might be when like Muddy Waters is playing, you know, in Pepper's Lounge. I think well, I think that's Otis Rush. Is it? Oh, right, okay, and it's you, and there's, you're the only white guy in there, you can see it's just... It's standing right behind me in that picture as a waitress, that's Mary, that's the one that told Muddy that I played. Yeah, right. <laughs> if it hadn't been for, like, her, uh, she kind of opened the door there, because yeah. I wouldn't... I didn't have a goal. To yeah, be, you weren't going yeah, I was just happy to be there. Yeah. You know? uh, uh, really cool. But once people heard me sitting in, like Muddy would demand that I sit in, he can't say no or, or leave. <laughs> no, sorry, I'm not and happy. other musicians heard me and they started offering me jobs. Said, hey man, you know, next um, Wednesday we're at this club, why don't you come by? And uh, we can't pay you much, but I think you can pay me some. Something you gonna pay me? Well, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I'll be there. And uh, so that just that was the beginning. It just developed from there. Yeah. So what what harmonicas? What brand of harmonicas were you playing then? Was that well, back cider? then? It was only Honer that only Honer. Yeah. When you get an American Ace, but there was such they were just they didn't. Yeah. They were but, very good. And um, guitar. I mean, you, what what was your first guitar that you bought? You know, because you. Or got or had or whatever. The first guitar I owned was a, called a Supertone. Yeah. It had belonged to my dad. And uh, I remember the only time I've ever seen a picture of one, there's one on the cover of a Big Bill Brunsey album yeah. in Columbia. It's, it's a bed with a guitar laying on it. And that's, that guitar is exactly like the one I had. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I had a a uh, Les Paul that Otis Rush gave me. Yeah. That was pretty nice. That's... I loaned him my car. He had to go, I think he had to go to Omaha to do a gig. Yeah. And uh, he, his car was either broke down or he didn't have a car, I forget. And I happened to have a car and I said, he didn't take my car. And he went and did the gig. When he came back, brought the car, his car back, he gave me this guitar for yeah. loaning him the... I was rushed, wow. That's... I didn't hadn't asked for Anything, you know, I just yeah, he's just having it all about, and yeah. yeah, and he's like, but I, you know, he must have seen like I'm very grateful and that, and he's like hasn't didn't forget it and goes. Well, here. we used to play every Sunday at the I Spy Lounge on 63rd <laughs> Street, and Otis told me he thought that was the roughest bar in town in Chicago. Yeah, I thought there was some rougher places like down the street there was the the Cha 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 Lounge yeah. where. Uh, uh, Hound Dog Taylor played. I thought that was a rougher place. Did you ever meet Hound Dog? I suppose, or did you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I never played with him, but yeah. uh, that I remember. But I knew him. And yeah, I, I really loved the way he played. So, did he really have um, like yeah. six fingers, or he had another little finger? Yeah, yeah he did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did he? Would that be part of his style? Did you, did you ever not? Uh, I don't remember him yeah. using so, an extra little <laughs> finger. <laughs> <laughs> I had incorporated in a, you know, it'd be quite funny to um to watch uh, you know, if that stretched out that a little bit further to you know <laughs> grab yeah, a Yeah, I just don't remember uh, noticing that or paying attention to that. Yeah. So you um you've had throughout the years lots of amazing guitarists play with you, you know, in your band. Yeah. I mean I suppose it'd be really hard to pick a favourite or, you know, um, because they're all good. I mean, even like Matt, Matt Stubbs that you have playing now, he's great, you know. Yeah. And I, you know, I think he's getting better, you know. He's kind of, yeah, it's really cool what Matt's, the direction he's heading in. He, you know, well, and he's, he's only young like too. one of those guys that just learns a little bit and then levels off and stays there. He's, and I'm still yeah. learning too. I keep, yeah. <laughs> I'm always thinking about a new way to play or how to be better or something. Yeah. And I always try to hire the best guys I could find because yeah. the better they are, the better they make me sound. Yeah. Yeah. And I learn from them too. And so you've, you know, you've got that book too, haven't you? Like the book of all you, you know, when you need a, a guitarist oh, yeah, have, or you know. I have a list of yeah, you know, phone numbers for all different yeah. instruments. And a musical directory. <laughs> well, you know, you never know. Somebody can, might get sick or something. Yeah. You can't make it. You, yeah. You make a call. Yeah, cool. Wherever you are in the country. Yeah. <laughs> well, gee, um, 
I um, I loved. I could talk with you for days, to be honest. You know, I just um, hearing you play guitar. I remember hearing you play guitar. Uh, the first time was I don't know, probably one of the first times you were in Australia. You pulled out a blue guitar. It was blue. I'm pretty sure, an acoustic. Oh, I like got semi-acoustic. Yeah. Like F holes on it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a Gibson. Yeah. And I was remember it's just because we went to see you as a harmonica player, and to be honest, I was like, uh, you know, when you know you did all, you broke it down and brought out the the guitar, and I was like, thank you. Wow. <laughs> I don't remember bringing that guitar here, but the only blue guitar I got is yeah, it was. Uh, they called it Beale Street Blue. Yeah. But it was made at the factory in Memphis, yeah. and they came up with that blue color. <laughs> and call it Beale Street. It, on the back of it, in, in little gold letters, it says Beale Street Blue or yeah. something like that. Yeah. I'm doing these blogs because I love blues music and I know you guys do too, so let's share it. Share it to all your friends and show them the power of blues music.